Well, Pastor James, let's start with you. Okay. Good question here, and this is one from Instagram. We mentioned that just a moment ago. So Cindy uh, submits this question. Would the Bible Q&A uh, panel please break down the age of Moses in comparison with the phases of his ministry to the children of Israel, please? I'm confused about how long they wandered in the wilderness. Was Moses 40 years old when he left Egypt, spent 40 years in Midian, and 40 years in the wilderness, or 80 years in the wilderness? I asked because they failed with the 10 spies and had to go back to the wilderness and then went back after that generation died. I just get confused with the timeline. Please explain. Great question, Sydney, um, Cindy uh, from Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so Moses, yes, was 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in Midian, and 40 years in the wilderness, and uh, then laid to rest by the hand of God. That's the basic, simple answer to the question. I have three and a half more minutes, so I'm going to give you a little bit okay. more detail. All right. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the New Testament actually gives us the clearest answer to this, believe it or not. I was looking for the answers for this in Exodus, and then I found something in the New Testament, the book of Acts. Uh, and I thought we'd just read the verses. Acts chapter 7 is where we're going to be, be looking, beginning with verse 20, right? Stephen here is speaking. He's got to give a summary of the history of God's people <clears throat> leading up to his death. He's summarizing their history because probation is about to close for the nation of Israel as a nation. And so God is kind of using Stephen to summarize all that he has done to lead them to accept Christ as Messiah. And in the context of this summary of history, verse 20 picks up with Paul. I mean, excuse me, with Moses, mm -hmm. in which time Moses was born and was exceedingly fair and nourished up in his father's house for three months. Verse 21, and when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him and so nourished him for, as her own son. Verse 22, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Verse 23, and when he was fully 40 years old, so he's in Egypt, as an Egyptian raised as an Egyptian, he comes to the age of 40 years old. It came to pass to his heart excuse me, and it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffering wrong, he defended him and avenged him and him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Verse 25, for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Verse 26, the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, your brethren, why do you do wrong to one another? Verse 27, but he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Verse 28, Will thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Verse 29, then Moses at this saying, Moses fled at this saying and was in uh, was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. So he's in Egypt for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And then as he comes to assist his brethren and ends up killing an Egyptian and he's discovered, he takes off and he's in the land of Midian where he has two sons. And then verse 30 says, And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness the, on the Mount Zion an angel of the Lord in the flame uh, in a flame of fire in the bush. So there's another 40 years. You got your first 40 in Egypt, then yes. you got your second 40 in Midian. Mm -hmm. Verse 31, when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight and was, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him saying, I am the, the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. And then said the Lord unto him, put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. I've seen, verse 34, I've seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I've heard their uh, groaning, and I've come down to deliver them, and now I'm come, and now come, and I will send thee unto Egypt. And verse 35, so <clears throat> this Moses they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same God did send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared unto him in the bush. Verse 36, And he brought them out after he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness. 40 years. Mm -hmm. So there's the last 40 years, Cindy. You've got the 40 years in Egypt, you've got the 40 years in Midian, and then you've got the 40 years in the wilderness. And so the Bible tells us that Moses was four score or 80 years old when he went back to Egypt to deliver God's people. That's Exodus 7 verse 7. And then the Bible says that Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes weren't dim nor his natural force abated. That was Deuteronomy 34 verse 7. Mm -hmm. There's all the verses, lays it out. <laughs> Amen. Excellent. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor James. Uh, Pastor Ryan, 
Good question here. This one also comes from Cindy, a different spelling. Okay. But uh, yeah, hers is with an S. But a uh, question here, um, at the second coming of our Lord Jesus, the wicked are asking for the rocks to fall on them. What eventually happens to them? Do they go back to the grave and await their master, who after a thousand years comes out and tries to take the new Jerusalem? Okay, so the simple answer to this is that they're destroyed. Okay, and I'm going to back Sorry. that up with Scripture now. This is what Jesus is referencing in both Matthew 24 and Luke chapter 17. I'm not going to read all the verses in Matthew 24, but for the sake of time, I'm going to start in Luke 17, and we're going to read verses 26 through 30. Notice what it says here. It says, As in the days of Noah, so shall also, the days of the, so shall also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And the flood came, notice, and what did it say? Destroyed them all. This is speaking of the wicked, right? Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, mm -hmm. they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven. And there it is again, the wicked, it destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So these men that are crying out for the rocks to fall on them, this is within the context of, of uh, Revelation chapter 6 and the sixth seal, the second coming of Jesus. Mm -hmm. They're crawling for the rocks to fall on them because they're ashamed of the fact that they've rejected Jesus Christ and now they're Im meeting their ultimate demise, which is the life is being taken from them. Now it's interesting, in Luke 17, past this, when you read verses 34 to 37, it's still within the context of this destruction of the wicked. Jesus goes on to say, uh, you know, there will be two men in one bed, one will be taken, one will be left. There will be two women grinding together, one will be taken, one will be left. There will be two men in one field, one will be left, one will be taken. And then the disciples ask this interesting question. They say, where, Lord? And of course, they're referencing where are those taken? Are those people that are taken, it's that their lives are being taken. We know that because of Jesus' response. And uh, in verse 37, he goes on to say, where the body is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now, if you look at verse 28 in Matthew 24, which is the equivalent verse, Jesus actually says, for whatsoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. What's a carcass? Mm -hmm. A carcass is obviously a dead body. So what's happening at the second coming of Jesus when these men in those moments, in those fearful, horrific moments, when they're realizing what's happening, that they didn't give their life to Jesus, that they did not serve Him and abide in Him in their life. They're realizing what's happening and they would rather just the rocks crush them than have to face the Lamb of God who's returning to get them. And so uh, that's why in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul writing again about the second coming of Jesus and the redemption of God's people. In verse 8, he says there, this is 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of His mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of His is coming. We see this within the context of the seventh and final plague there in Revelation chapter 16, where it says that there in verse 21, it says, And there fell upon men great hell out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. This is destruction. There are many, many texts. Go read Isaiah chapter 24, Jeremiah chapter 4, talking about the return of the, of the Lord. The wicked did not go on to live, as some might believe, for seven years of tribulation, but rather they're destroyed at the second coming of Jesus. Mm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much, Pastor Ryan. And Shelley, this question comment comes from Patricia uh, from New York, and that's really, it's a tragic, tragic question. It says, my son suddenly passed away two years ago, and it's been devastating. I'm very worried about his salvation, so I pray to God to have mercy on him. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 19, the Lord said, and this is God speaking, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. My nephew goes to a Pentecost church and claims to speak in tongues and said, that to, and said to me that when people die, they go to heaven or hell right away, and that me praying for my son is equal to doing witchcraft. I disagree, but is there anything you can tell me about it? Mm. Mm. Patricia, first, I just want to say my heart breaks for you. I can't imagine anything worse than losing a child and the yes. grief that follows wow. that. But I hope you have a pen and a paper because the answer I'm going to give you, I want you to write all these scripture references down so that you can look them up and be assured it's a biblical answer. In Exodus 33, 19, when God says, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, you have to look in context. He's speaking to a people who have broken his covenant mm -hmm. and, and they're no longer in relationship with God but he forgives them. And when he does, it's still, when he renews the relationship, it's still requiring the same conditions and obedience as before. And he, 
still asked them to obey his covenant law. Now, let me say something. I don't believe your nephew's opinion is scriptural at all. That's right. Here is the scriptures I want you to write down. In 1 Timothy 6, 16, the Bible says, God alone has immortality right now. 1 John 5, 11 and 12, it's talking about that God has given eternal life to those who have the Son. If you are in Christ, it says, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. So it's something that we secure during our earthly life, but we fully realize after the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54 explains that when Christ returns at the sound of the trumpet, that's when we put on immortality if we're a believer as we come up in the first resurrection. And John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus said, don't marvel at this. There's a day that's coming that all who are in their grave will hear his voice. Some will come forward to the resurrection of life. Others come forward to the resurrection of condemnation. Those are separated by a thousand years. Ecclesiastes chapter five, nine, Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. let me say that one again. Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verses five and 10 are two of many scriptures that talk about when we are dead, we have an unconscious sleep. And you know, I love this scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, 17 and 18. Paul is telling the people who, some were telling him, oh, Christ isn't resurrected. He says, hey, if Christ isn't risen, your faith is futile and all who have fallen asleep, that's a metaphor for death, in Christ have perished. Hmm. So he didn't see people up in heaven. He knew there was no life until the resurrection. But now here's the difficult thing to tell you and I will soften it at the end. There's no opportunity after death to have a second chance of salvation. Mm. We have already determined our destiny before we die. Hebrews 9.27 says it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. There's no purgatory. That is a pagan philosophy. There's no hellfire till the end of the earth when God mm -hmm. will create a lake of fire on the earth. And in Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15, that fire is, re is referred to as the second death. Anyone whose name is not in the book of life, it is a second death. They're ashes, they're totally destroyed. So here's what I wanna tell you. Your son's in the grave. Mm -hmm. He is unconscious, awaiting. You don't know what he did the last second. He could have been like the thief on the cross mm -hmm. and accepted Christ. But if he rejected God, your son would not be happy in heaven. He would prefer to perish. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Shelley, and thank you for all the scripture references, you know, as well. And, mm -hmm. and Patricia, it's a great answer. Uh, Patricia, we want you to know that all of us here at 3 ABN will continue to lift you up in prayer because a loss like that, yes. as Shelley mentioned, the loss of a child, uh, so devastating. So we will continue to pray for you uh, in that loss. Mm -hmm. Pastor James, a question here from Melinda okay. from Michigan. Okay. And uh, the book of James. Fitting to your name, isn't it? Okay. All right. So the book of James. <laughs> okay. The book of James says we ought to confess our sins to one another. Mm -hmm. Would that read better as confess our faults to each other as our sins are to be confessed to God and God alone? All right, Melinda in Michigan. Yes, that would be a great translation. Mm -hmm. Faults, not sins. In fact, uh, the translation of the KJV. Uh, is really good in relation to this. You know, being raised a Catholic, I'm sensitive to this issue because I was raised going to church and confessing sins to another man, a priest, in order to get absolution or forgiveness. So I, I recognize the sensitivity of this issue. Uh, the word faults is actually translated from a different Greek word. It means to slide or slip, excuse me, to side slip, uh, unintentional error or transgression. Sin has a completely different origin than faults. Uh, it means to miss the mark or to sin. So, but with that said, however, 
I do wanna, uh, don't want to place too much emphasis on the Greek. There's a lot of times we can uh, get misdirected when we place a lot of emphasis on Greek translations, Greek words, especially when we consider that the Greek word for false in James 5.16 is used in a number of places in the New Testament for sin and for transgression and for offenses that are forgiven by Christ. So we don't want to say, well, this isn't really talking about sin and transgression in James chapter 5. It's just talking about something a little different. There is a little bit of nuance there with the Greek. But the more significant point that is being made by James is that while our sins are to be confessed to God alone, who is the only one who can actually forgive us our sins mm -hmm. on a salvational level, if those sins are committed against individuals, we should ask those individuals for forgiveness also. That's the yeah. process of confession. We need to personally go to in individuals that we may have mm -hmm. sinned against and ask them to forgive us. Now, note this point with care. When you ask an individual to forgive you, that's not a salvational level. An individual can never forgive you on a salvational level. Yeah. Only God can forgive us right. on a salvational level. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you so very much, Pastor James. Yeah, great answer. You know, it's so comforting to find answers from God's Word. That's right. Yeah. Something we can stand on. And going back to that uh, question you know, that that lady had for Tricia, too, you know, we can trust in the righteous judge, too, right? Amen. God knows everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, praise That's the Lord. Right. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Great answer. Let's see. Pastor Ryan, this is um, this person is from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and it's a beautiful name. And I, I, I don't know. I'm going to try and pronounce this here. Um, you can help me out on this, Pastor Ryan. It looks like Sisyphon. Sis Sisophon, beautiful name though, from Philadelphia. What do you think, Pastor Ryan? I think that's, I think you did okay. a good job of okay. accepting that. <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much for submitting. Great question here. Do you guys think it's wrong to excommunicate sinful people from the church? Mm. Therefore, if we follow the Holy Bible and the examples of Jesus Christ, shouldn't the church follow the biblical truth and let the Lord Jesus Christ do the sifting and gathering? Why do churches put guilt shame and condemnation on the people who are already spiritually lacking. Okay. All right. So uh, first of all, I want to say straight up, we should always, I th and I think the church absolutely should always seek uh, for a redemptive plan That's of great. restoration. Yeah, That's great. Um, we should always we'd be as gracious and forgiving as Jesus is, right? Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, we also have to keep in mind that even the God of the universe had to excommunicate or banish or disfellowship someone from his own kingdom. Mm -hmm. And we know that was Lucifer along mm -hmm. with one third of the fallen angels from heaven. Uh, but that did not come before Christ had provided an opportunity sufficient time mm -hmm. for Lucifer and those angels to repent mm -hmm. and, and to confess and, and to be brought back into the fold. Now that being said, the, an the direct answer to your question here, uh, you know, do we think that it's wrong to excommunicate or in this case to fellowship sinful people from the church? There are appropriate times when the Bible does uh, counsel us indeed to do that when it's extreme cases. For instance, when a person is habitually committing open sin before the brethren potentially causing stumbling block or in this case maybe even dividing the flock of the church. That's when we have to practice Matthew chapter 18, the counsel given there. Matthew 18 verses 15 through 17 says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more. That's mm. being elders, pastor mm -hmm. from the church. But notice that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. But then comes verse 17. And if he refuses to hear him, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him uh, be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Look at the, at the, at the, uh, back at the, uh, the culture of Jesus' day, uh, the heathen and the tax collector, mm -hmm. they, were, they were separate from everyone else. They were, they were considered as the, on the low end of the totem pole. And then mm -hmm. in other words, they were they would keep themselves distanced from these people. Um, also in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's a lot to be said here where Paul writes in just the opening five, first five verses. Notice what he says, 1 Corinthians 5 verses 1 through 5. Uh, it is actually reported, Jesus, this is Paul speaking to the church, he said it's reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such, se such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, mm. that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has, notice, done this deed might be taken away from among you, okay? Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say, for I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. He goes on to say, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together among with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan 
to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on in, down a few more verses in verses 9 through 13. And again, all of this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So now you go down to verses 9 through 13 and he talks about how he says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep uh, company with sexual moral people. And then he uh, down in verse 11, he says, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. He's talking about a brother in the church, your, your brother in Christ. So a, a member of the church. He goes on to describe who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. He says, don't even eat with them. Uh, for what have I to do with judging those who, uh, who are outside? Do, not, uh, do you not judge those who are inside? Mm. But those who are outside, uh, God judges. And then he says, therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. So are there mm. opportunities in Scripture that the scripture counsels us that there may be times when we have to make these tough decisions mm -hmm. and say, brother, sister, we've given you opportunity to change, to repent, but you are, you're rebellious. Sometimes we have to be brought to those situations. Uh, just a couple of scriptures I'm going to reference here in the last 20 seconds I have. not going to read it, but read Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 20, where he talks about noting those who cause divisions and offenses within the brethren. And then, of course, Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 31, where Paul talks about how we are overseers of God's church and that we have to protect those who come in as wolves to divide the flock. So yes, there are appropriate times in which we have to take mm, these actions. Yeah, excellent explanation on that. And I like what you said at the beginning too, Pastor Ryan, that is a deal redemptively, right? Absolutely. That's the first. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, praise the Lord. Mm. Very good. Good question too. Uh, Sister Shelley, uh, this person asks, am I sinning if I don't take part in foot washing, but in the bread and grape juice only? I don't mind washing someone else's feet, but I am embarrassed to let anyone see mine. Okay. Let me just say this. I remember like it was yesterday, my first foot washing mm. service. Okay. And I was so happy to stoop and wash the feet of a 90 year old matriarchal saint in the church. Okay. But boy, when she washed mine, it was humbling. Mm. It was an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. In John 13, five through 10, at, last, at the last supper, when Jesus instituted the ordinance of communion. What he did is he poured water in a basin, put a towel around his waist, and then he's going around and washing the disciples' feet. This was a servant's task. He gets to Peter. Peter says, oh no, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Never. And he says, hey, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. Now Peter goes to the extreme and says, oh, well, not just my feet, but my head also. Mm -hmm. Wash me all over. And so Jesus answers, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. He is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Now let me explain this. The service of foot washing is something that symbolizes cleaning after we have been baptized. It's a symbolic thing. Baptism is like our justification by faith. Foot washing is like sanctification mm. by faith because they were clean and we're clean, but our daily walk, our feet get sullied. Mm. So the act of washing our feet is meant to humble us and it is the perfect preparatory part of communion service. But I have to say, it only has merit if we've already confessed our sins before mm -hmm. the Lord. John 13, 14, Jesus said in this same context, if I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Mm -hmm. In the Greek, that word ought is obligatory. You're obliged. You are, uh, you, you owe it as a duty to do this. And then he says in verse 15, John 13, 15, for I've given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And as I said, this is a beautiful preparatory part of the communion service. The one who stoops to wash the feet following in Jesus' footsteps, the one whose feet are washed, they are humbled. And he says in verse 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Mm -hmm. So here's what I want to say to you. If there is a condition about your feet that is embarrassing, that you don't want your feet to be seen, put on some 
nine, some thin nylon socks and have participate in the foot washing mm. service with those nylon socks on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good, Shelly. Thank you for that answer. And I know I've done some foot washing with someone, a gentleman that uh, wore his socks actually, mm -hmm. but uh, that was, that's okay. So thank you so much yes. for scriptural references too. Uh, for that. I want to remind you, if you have questions, you've been studying the Bible or something that you've been listening to today or watching, you're like, wow, I wonder about that. This is how you can submit them to 3ABN. Multiple ways. Email is BibleQA at 3ABN.tv or you can always text us at 618-228-3975. You can go to Instagram. That's 3ABN underscore official. That's 3ABN underscore official. Many ways you can submit your questions or comments here to 3ABN Today Bible Q&A. I also want to remind you about 3ABN Plus. That's a great way to go and re-watch this program. You can hit pause, rewind, rewind and play. Again, that's 3ABNplus.tv. You can go there, find Bible Q&A programs, Sabbath school programs, many of 3ABN's most watched programs right there at 3ABNplus.tv. Pastor James, uh, we'll come to you next. Uh, Sherry from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. All right. This is the question. Satan was cast out of heaven to earth before Adam and Eve were created, but it says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Who was dwelling on the earth at this time? They said this was at a different time, a different time before God created the earth, what does that mean, a different time? I heard this on Salvation, Symbols, and Signs, program number 50 at the, about the 16-minute mark. That's a program on 3ABN. Mm -hmm. It would be great if Pastor James could answer this since he was teaching this. Thank you. He referenced John chapter 12, 31 through 32. Great question, Sherry. Excellent question, <laughs> Sherry, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Right. Thank you for that question. Yes, we did reference that in Revelation chapter 12. So we'll take a look at Revelation chapter 12, just an overview of Revelation chapter 12. So Revelation 12, 1 through 5 is a basic summary of the salvation plan that God has put in effect for all of us. The woman there is great with child, the child being Christ, the woman representing the church, specifically the church of Israel, the Jewish church. Christ is born. The dragon Satan tries to destroy him as soon as he's born. That takes place through Herod when, child, when Christ is just a child. And then it says that the child is caught up to heaven. Of course, we don't have the details of the fact that Christ you know, lived and died to save us from our sins. It just says he's caught up to heaven in verse 5, and then the woman in verse 6 flees into the wilderness. Then you transition to another section, Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, takes us back to the war in heaven. And really, it's an explanation of why Christ had to come, be born of the Jewish church, mm -hmm. and redeem us. Because mm -hmm. there was a war that began in heaven between Michael and his angels and the devil and his angels, and they fought and that devil was cast out of heaven. That's the cast out you're referring to. That's the cast out that we're all familiar with. That's the cast out where Satan is physically removed from heaven. The problem with him being physically removed is that there's still a little bit of sympathy there. There's, there's still a few questions that are unanswered in the minds of angels. In fact, one third of the angels are actually deceived and go with him. The other angels need clarification. God casts him out, but God still has to clarify this whole issue about Satan and his accusations against God's throne. So Jesus doesn't just come to redeem us. Jesus also comes to bring clarification to who God is, what he is really like, to God's justice and his mercy, to his character. That's what we see taking place in the next verse. In order to understand the next verse, that is Revelation 12, verse 10, we need to go to John chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. And that's what we'll do right now. John 12, 31 and 32 says this, and Jesus here is going to the cross. He's going to make the final sacrifice. And he says, John chapter 12, 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the mm -hmm. prince of this world be cast out. Yep. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, mm -hmm. will draw all men unto me. So really verse 5 where Christ is taken up into heaven, that verse takes place after what we read in John chapter 12, 31 and 32. Jesus is crucified and when he's crucified, guess what? Satan is unmasked. Mm -hmm. The character of Satan is revealed before the unfallen universe and they see him for who he really is. Their questions are all answered. Now it's come salvation. He's cast out of not only physically, but he's cast out of the sympathies of the unfallen world. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth. We have yet to learn what the unfallen universe has learned about the character mm. of Satan. 
We still have sympathy with the devil, as that old Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone song says. And God is seeking through the revelation of Jesus Christ, lifting up Jesus Christ, to remove all of those sympathies, the sympathies that have been removed from the unfallen universe, to remove all those sympathies from the fallen universe. Mm, excellent. Thank you for that clarification, Pastor James. Yeah, praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, this question comes from, let's see here, make sure I get this right. Tony, Nashville, Tennessee. It's not right. too far away from 3 ABN. says, we know that every eye shall see Jesus when he returns. But for those that crucified him, will there be a special resurrection or will they rise with those in the first one in order to see Christ actually come and then go back to the grave to awake with the wicked? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Tony, for that question. And the answer is very clear. I'm going to provide a two or three texts here to support this, but the direct answer to your question is mm. that yes, there is mm -hmm. a special resurrection that will occur of the wicked at the second coming of Jesus for those individuals who participated or had anything to do with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So first I want to start in Daniel, or Daniel chapter 12 just to set the foundation for this. Daniel chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. This, was in the, this is within the context of those events leading up to the second coming of Christ. It says there, And at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. So that's the righteous, right? The people whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. But then verse 2 comes within the context of that glorious appearing of Jesus in the clouds. It says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Okay, we know this to be the, you know, within the context of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where it says the dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. I think it's verse 51 there in 1 Corinthians 15. So this is, we know the righteous at the second coming of Jesus will come forth out of the graves. But the, the majority of the dead, they, they are destroyed. Those who are alive are destroyed by the brightness of His coming according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 there, verse 8. Uh, uh, it, but also there, it makes it very clear that the righteous that are already dead in the grave, well, they remain in the graves except for a specific group of people. Yeah. It goes on to say there in verse 2, mm -hmm. uh, did I say unrighteous? Yeah, I meant unrighteous, unrighteous is what I meant. Thank you for that correction. Mm -hmm. uh, verse 2 of Daniel 12, here it says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake some to everlasting life. Okay. But then it goes on to say some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, Revelation chapter one, verse seven, notice what Jesus says. Behold, speaking of, of his coming, because he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him mm -hmm. and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Even those who pierce him, well, that would be Caiaphas and mm. you know, the majority of the, of the priests there, the Sanhedrin, those Roman guards that participated in the, in the, mm. uh, in the crucifixion itself. All those individuals will be resurrected because they will actually see physically Jesus coming back in the clouds. Now, wow. one more text. Where do we mm. get the foundation of this from? Mm. Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus was standing trial at that Sanhedrin, yep. uh, during, before the Sanhedrin court uh, in, in 31 AD. It goes on to say, uh, but Jesus kept silent. This is Matthew 26 verses 63 and 64. But Jesus kept silent and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ and the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the mm -hmm. Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Wow. So very plainly put, Daniel 12, Matthew 26, Revelation 1, we have clear texts there that tell us that yes special resurrection will occur of those who pierced Christ. Mm, yeah, very Thank you very much. Very clear. Very clear from the Word of God. Thank you Pastor Ryan. Uh, Shelly, question from Gloria. She's, um, she lives in Maryland. In Exodus chapter 33 verse 11 Moses spoke to God face to face. Genesis chapter 32 verse 30 and this is Jacob for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Then back to Exodus chapter 33, 20 and 22 says, No man has seen my face and lived. Which is the truth? Did people see God and live? <laughs> That's a great question. Mm -hmm. And I studied this out myself some time ago mm -hmm. out of curiosity. In Genesis 32, 30, when Jacob wrestled with a man, he knew it was God that he was wrestling with. This was what they call a Christophany. This was an appearance of the pre-incarnate second person of the Godhead. In other words, the 
one who would become Jesus Christ. This was before he was incarnated. And um, it, it, Hosea 12, 4 identifies this man that Jacob was wrestling with as the angel of the Lord, who is also identified as God. Now in Exodus 33, 11, when it says that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, this is a figurative mm -hmm. expression. He was, it just means that God had direct communication mm. with Moses. He didn't do it through visions or dreams. And we know it's figurative because you go right on down in Exodus 33 to verse 20, and God says to Moses, you can't see my face. No man shall see my mm -hmm. face and live. And in verse uh, 22, when, when Moses says, show me your glory, God says, so it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft mm -hmm. of the rock and I will cover with my hand while I pass by. And then when I take away my hand, you shall see my back, but you shall not my face shall not be seen. Mm. You know, in 1 Timothy 6.16, the Bible says that God lives in unapproachable light. Mm. It is the penetrating purity mm. of His love. Love cannot sin. This is what makes God holy. And His love is a consuming fire of sin. The flame of his love, if you're a sinner and you're in God's presence, it, you just go. Wow. That's why when they right. return, they're going to be seen. Mm -hmm. But so we know fallen man cannot stand in the presence of God. But I've just got to tell you this. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart for mm -hmm. they shall see God. Mm -hmm. And the same apostle who, uh, who, who writes, no one has seen God at any time, John 1, 18. Same apostle says in 1 John 3, 2 to 3, we shall see him as he is. Mm -hmm. And in Revelation 22, 4, mm -hmm. again, John writes, they shall see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Amen. Mm, amen. amen. Thank you so much, Sister Shelley. See, in the last few minutes here, I think we have enough time to do one more question each. So Pastor James, I'll try and read this quick uh, okay. question quickly. It comes from Adoration from Seattle, Washington. Is moving out to the country biblical? Mm. Is oh. off-grid living necessary? <laughs> <laughs> I have noticed many Seventh-day Adventists looking for land that is off-grid versus country living. Mm. Won't we have to flee to the mountains anyways during the great time of trouble and rely on God regardless of how self-sufficient our home is in the country? All right, there's a couple questions there. So yes. we'll deal with the first one. Is country living uh, biblical? Well, we can see from the very beginning that country living is biblical. God put us in a garden and yes. he wanted us to be surrounded with the beauties of nature. Uh, nature is God's second book. It speaks to us, it speaks to our senses and it invigorates us. I love being out in nature mm -hmm. and I love living in the country. Now I'm a city boy by nature. My wife was a city girl raised in Southern California. I was raised in London. <laughs> so that's our natural tendency. But when I moved out to the country, it was hard at first, you know, because it was so different. You know, there was no convenience stores around the corner. You know, you had to go three hours to get to an airport to fly out and I did a lot of flying. But <laughs> eventually I settled into it and now I love living in the country. That's what we were made for. We were made to be in nature. And this is what we see all through the Bible. In fact, country living was God's call to his people, um, to Abraham. Abraham did it. Uh, Moses did it. Jacob did it. Isaac did it. All of them avoided city dwelling. Even Christ lived in the small community of Nazareth as opposed to the metropolis of Jerusalem. Now, and that's not to say that God doesn't have a city dwelling for us. The New Jerusalem is going to be a city dwelling for sure. And we're going to have a mansion in the New Jerusalem, but that's going to be, as far as we can tell, the only city in the new heaven and the new earth. The rest is going to be country living. And we can mm. see that when the <clears throat> God's people were taken into the new uh, Canaan and into the promised land, they were all given a section of land, a section of mm. property, which would be great. Uh, as a cure, I think, for big government today to just give people land and help them to develop um, that land. Those are the good old days and they're the biblical days. Now, the second half of the question is off-grid living necessary. Now, I've noticed, um, you know, that you said that many Adventists are looking to live off-grid. 
I don't think off-grid living is necessary. You know, we are going to have a time when we're going to have to flee to the mountains, and so we're going to be off-grid. But why bring a time of trouble beforehand? <laughs> there are conveniences that help life to be easier for us. Why not take advantage of those conveniences right now? Sometimes we want to live off-grid because we don't want anything to change when the time of trouble comes, and so we want to be used to it. Well, when that time comes, oh, have a generator, live off-grid for that time, but why do it ahead of time? I think it's beneficial for us to take advantage of the conveniences that we have in our world today so that we can get on with God's work and not be distracted with all of the extra work that it takes to live off-grid. Now, that's not saying that uh, it's wrong for someone to live off-grid, grid. If you choose to live off grid, I think it's great, you know, um, if it's desired. But there's no reason for us to bring that time of trouble on us ahead of time. When the time comes and we have to flee to the mountains and we have to live off grid, well, that's something that will endure at that time. Why do it now? Mm. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, a couple of questions in there. So thank you so very much for great answers from God's Word. Pastor Ryan, a question from Pam, Trinidad, Tobago. All right. I see many of the churches today dealing with spiritual warfare. Does the Seventh-day Adventist Church help people who are being afflicted via witchcraft? The answer is yes. Okay. Um, it, you may not hear as much about it because, mm -hmm. you know, these are kind of, well, we know that, you know, demonic uh, oppression and, and witchcraft, it's, it's a thing in our world, but you don't hear about it a lot, but it's a real thing. And so in this case, yeah, you may not hear or know of there, that there are ministries. Uh, I'll just give you one right off the bat. There's one that uh, actually Shelley made me recently aware of that I did not know about. It's Set Free in Christ Institute. Set Free in Christ Institute. And they have a website, setfreeinchrist.org. So setfreeinchrist.org. Go there, Pam, uh, and, and maybe bring it to your pastor's attention. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a ministry that has brought information together from Scripture on how to you know, deal with exorcisms, and things like that of people who are being demonically uh, oppressed or in this case uh, oppressed by witchcraft of any kind, uh, I, would, I would very much encourage you to go to that website and check it out. And this, this particular organization can help in terms of, of bringing about the proper measures needed to take for someone dealing with this. That being said, the scripture makes it very clear. We should also all uh, follow the scriptural uh, counsel on this. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith uh, a prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. My friends, in this case, we should be there for one another. If someone's uh, hurting or they're, they're dealing with some type of, of demonic oppression or witchcraft in this case, we need to be there to pray for these brothers. Now, the truth of the matter is uh, a lot of ministers are, are a little... They're a little skittish to even get involved in something like this because of what we read, you know, in, in Acts chapter 19 mm -hmm. uh, about, you know, the, the, the sons of Sava right. are out there. You know, they're hearing Paul yeah. casting out demons in the name of the Lord. And they decide, oh, we're going to go out here and do the same thing. So they find themselves a, a demonic guy that's full of the devil. And, and they, they start to try to cast him out. And the demon speaks to this guy and says, I know Jesus. I know Paul. Who are you? And yeah. then the demons leap on these guys and they whoop them up really nice and send them naked out the door running. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the idea is some ministers are a little hesitant to get involved in this type of ministry because they themselves were afraid that they might have something in their life that, that those demons may, may uh, you know, expose. Mm -hmm. In this case, my friends, there, there is hope. Uh, we also need to also know that, you know, in, in extreme cases, Jesus counsels us in Matthew 17 that uh, it, sometimes uh, we have to do a little bit of prayer and fasting. So this is mm -hmm. Matthew 17 verses 19 through 21, he says that it's only, he says uh, right here, he says, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Mm. Pam, you or whoever you might know mm. that sparked this question that might be dealing with this, maybe they need to pray, maybe they need to fast, call on the elders of the church, Amen. contact set, in free, set Free in Christ Institute, go on that website, do all that you can. No one should be oppressed by demons. Mm. Jesus has mm -hmm. power over, over the, 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 the works of darkness. Mm -hmm. Just simply call out to him, take the proper measures and that person, you or whoever it is, can indeed be set free in mm. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, great Amen. advice. Thank Amen. you so very much. Great answer. Sister Shelley, uh, Brian from Spokane, Washington asks, I'm confused by the way the concept of spirit is used in the Bible. In Genesis 2, 7, the breath that God breathed into man is referred to as the spirit. When I read Galatians 5, 18, it talks about being led by the spirit. When I saw spirit capitalized, I thought that was referring to the Holy Spirit. 
Interestingly, when I looked up the Greek word for spirit in this text in Galatians, it said it is pneuma, which means breath. That confused me. So how can breath lead us? Whenever spirit is mentioned in the Bible, if it is not referring to the Holy Spirit, does it always mean breath? Okay. The Greek word pneuma can mean spirit, wind, or breath. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what you looked it up in mm -hmm. most places that I've looked. It, it talks about spirit, wind, or breath. Mm -hmm. And when you were saying in Galatians 5.18, led by the spirit, that is the Holy Spirit. You have mm -hmm. to read in context when you see the word pneuma. And in context, you'll know when to capital, put the capital S, that always refers to the Holy Spirit of God. Romans 5, 5 says that God pours out His love, the essence of His being into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. That's not just a breath or a wind. That's God's Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. In John 14, 16, Jesus said, I will pray the Father. He will give you Another helper, allos parakletos is what the Greek says. And you know what's interesting? That means another helper who is exactly like me and that he may abide with you forever. A parakletos is an advocate, legal assistant that pleads someone's cause, an intercessor, counselor, comforter, or helper. So when Jesus says in John, the next verse, he says, the spirit of truth, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. Now, John 3, 8, Jesus told Nicodemus, the wind blows where it wishes mm. and you hear it, but you can't tell where it is. And he said, so it is with everyone who's born of the spirit. Mm. Now, some people say, aha, that denies the personhood of the Holy Spirit. No, it's simply an expression. Jesus is explaining the mode of operation of the spirit. And you know, we call Jesus the gate. We call him the door, the mm -hmm. vine, the bread of life. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean Jesus is not a person. That's right. But let me just quickly tell you what the functions of the Holy Spirit are. He inspired the scriptures. He illuminates the scriptures for us to understand. He convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He exalts Christ, calls people to the Savior. Mm -hmm. He affects regeneration, the rebirth. He cultivates Christian character and the fullness of stature. He bestows spiritual gifts. He seals us for the day of redemption. And you better believe Numa, the Spirit, mm -hmm. capital S, is the third person of the Godhead. He is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you so very much, Sister Shelley. Thank you for your passion and excitement, too. I about love it. that topic. We're going to take a quick break and be right back with some closing comments. If you're enjoying our 3 ABN Bible Q&A, then tell your friends. Each Monday, we'll bring you a fresh program answering the Bible questions you send us, using God's Holy Word to shed light on those texts that seem difficult to understand. To have your questions answered on a future program, just email them to us at BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. That's BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. You may also text your questions to 618-228-228. 3975. That's 618-228-3975. Be sure to include your name and where you live, and then watch 3ABN Bible Q&A for answers from God's Word. The Bible Q&A programs always go by in a hurry. Starting with you, Pastor James, we're around the circle. Any closing comments? Any clarifications? Just in Revelation chapter okay. 12, the devil has come down unto us having great wrath. He knows his time is short. His okay. whole focus now is on earth because the unfallen universe has seen him for who he really is. Mm. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Thank you for that. How about you? Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Mm. Stick to the word of God. It'll provide all the answers. Yeah, amen. Thank you. I just want to say to Patricia, I hope... Like the thief on the cross, your son accepted Christ at the last moment. But God will not violate his free will. If your son rejected Christ, he would not be happy living for eternity in the presence of God. So the main point is that 
God loves your son. He loves you. God will be just and merciful. Mm, wow. Thank you so much, Pastor James. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. Thank you, Sister Shelley. And thank you for joining us. Thank you again for being part of our family. As I like to end each program, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>